This is information on our YouTube program. Not a, okay, let me pick this up. Okay. It's really easy to link the information. Like if you create a new event, just double click it. And in Simon's record, it'll now show that there's a meeting on August 4th. Go over to Simon's record, and it's right there. So we've linked your planner real well with your contact manager. Yeah, it wouldn't really happen if we signed up in between to do a quarterly mailing. And if we get the information in between the quarterly mailing, then, then you kind of fall in between. But this here, when you grab this brochure, I don't know if you've got one of those. No, we haven't got any other than Right, but with, with the application, the amount of time we sent out the brochure, if they were printed in time. And that goes through and explains the whole program and what, when you can re expect to read things on that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hello, Richard. These are free copies of Quicken, which we are giving away. This is version four, and we're giving it away to all the user group members who fill out our little database. Good, good demo. We talk, we'll talk a lot about the support for the software development. Good morning. Morning, everybody. Glad to see you again. Uh, the user group connection team, if y'all could come up in the front so I could introduce you. Let's see, starting right here, Michelle Free, who manages our community, uh, community user groups. We have Rye Livingston taking care of corporate and government groups. Dan Dougherty, who takes care of education user groups. Jerry Starr, who handles uh, professional associations. Jill Avery, her second year back now. Last year she was a newcomer, our communications coordinator. And Carmela Zamora, who handles all of our events, including the Macworld Breakfast. And also, we're happy to have Marianne Mather, the editor of uh, Quick Connect, joining us this morning. Thanks, guys. Okay, I'm going to move through my part of the presentation fairly quickly this morning because we want to get straight to the Newton demonstration. Um, but I did want to go over a couple of things that have been happening uh, and bring you up to date on a couple of things. First, the, uh, uh, the Performa program that we put out. Uh, several of, of the groups in this room participated in this program. It was a pilot of a purchase program for user groups. This isn't like the purchase program where we let you buy one machine per year. This is a purchase program open to user group members um, where we heavily discount a product uh, and uh, sell it directly to user group members. Uh, we put this together very quickly. We just needed to try it out to see how it worked. We had 13 groups participating. Um, we basically put the whole program together in about two weeks. Uh, it had a duration of two months. It ended last Friday. In that period of time, uh, we had uh, uh, about 450 Performa 400 sold within those 13 groups. Pretty successful program. The pricing was very aggressive. It was a Performa 400 at $899 uh, with a monitor and bundled software and one-year support. Uh, and if you wanted the really nice monitor, uh, we bumped it up to 949. And we're very happy with the, uh, the outcome on this program. Um, uh, we have some concerns about the process that we used. It was a little hinky. We made people uh, write a cashier's check and mail it in before we would send them the product. And that's a lot to ask somebody to go through. Uh, but uh, overall, we're pretty pleased with it. We're in the process now of beginning an evaluation of that program. And uh, we're hopeful that we'll be able to roll something out to the, to the full user group community uh, later on in the fall. So that was a very successful program for us, as far as we can tell. Um, the other thing I'd like to bring you up to date on is we've just completed, uh, around the beginning of July, we just completed the user group advisory council meeting. There were a couple of things that we were looking to do this year with user group advisory council. First was to include... Uh, 
more of the user group community at large in the activities of the council. One of the things the process task force put in place this year was the survey that you all received uh, back in May and then the disk based survey that came after that asking you to identify the issues that you were concerned about with Apple. Uh, and uh, I thought that was a very effective way to incorporate feedback from all of the user groups into the work of the council. And that was one of the key objectives this year was to try and get more people involved in the activities of the council from the user group community. The second objective was to try and get a better working relationship between Apple and, and user groups. And uh, in the past, the user group advisory council has come in They've talked to folks on the user group connection staff, and then we've sort of carried that message forward to the various managers inside of Apple. This year, we tried something a little bit different. We, form, we formed the user groups into task forces focused on particular issues, and then the user group connection brokered a relationship between the managers at Apple who were concerned about that issue and the task force from the advisory council that was concerned about it. And uh, what we've done this summer is is form those relationships going forward with uh, task forces on products, on support, on the process as, as ESA worked on, and on, uh, on uh, the user group connection deliverables as well. And we think that's going to be a great process going forward. I wanted to bring you up to date. I'm going to go very quickly read fast on the slide. Uh, I've always had this thing about top ten lists. I, last year I told the council, it's not, there's nothing magic about 10. You know, maybe you only have nine issues, maybe you got 15. Well, it turns out there were 11 uh, this year. And this is in order, in the order that you all ranked these issues on your disk based survey, um, how the issues came out. Top of the list again, uh, distribute free system software. And then some providing information to user groups, uh, providing discounted access to our mail system, uh, providing training materials, and uh, discounted product pricing. That's six of the top 11. And the last five, to plan transitions better for end-of-life products so we don't end up with the 2VX kind of situation that we had about this time last year, or January, I guess. And uh, to provide low or no-cost hypercard upgrades and define the role of uh, user groups in Apple's strategy and uh, educate Apple more about user groups and provide multi-platform connectivity. So that's how the issues came out this year and the task forces are working as we speak with the appropriate Apple managers uh, to deal with these issues. Now, I want to talk a little bit about some of the changes at Apple and some of the implications that those changes have on the user group connection and on the services we provide to user groups. The reason all of this is happening is because for many years, customers have been saying, we love your products, they're just too expensive. And so, in response to this pressure for lower prices, we've been reducing prices. There's two ways to do that. You reduce the costs and you reduce the margin, and we've been doing both of those things very aggressively. When I started with Apple, uh, going on six years ago, I remember being astonished that we had 55 points of gross margin in our products. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was kind of, it was, a, it was a very exciting place to be when you had that much of an advantage over your competitors that you could command those kind of prices. Um, we've seen margins dropping. I guess in our last quarter, uh, our gross margin was 38%. It's headed down another 10 points towards 28% in the next year. Um, to put those numbers in perspective, 10 points of gross margin on an $8 billion company is $800 million that has to come out of your cost structure or be made up for an increased volume. Uh, now, we're doing both of those. Our, our unit volume is way up uh, year to year. We're selling lots and lots more Macintoshes than we ever had before. Uh, but it's still not quite enough to offset that reduction in the gross margin. At the same time that we're dealing with that kind of financial pressure, we're also starting some key new initiatives. The Pi Group, which you're going to hear from in a few minutes, uh, with the Newton products. Um, Apple Online Services is going through a major transition. And the new formation of AppleSoft to have uh, software become a, a larger contributor to the profits of the company. All of those are putting pressure, additional pressure on what we're doing. 
And that's why on July 16th this year, Apple laid off 2,500 people. Uh, that's an incredibly painful process for, for us to go through. So this has caused us to rethink the way we do a lot of things at Apple. And among those things is the user group connection. There have been some constraints in the past that didn't allow the connection to realize all the benefits of the work that we did with user groups. And we're looking for opportunities to, to more directly fund what we do. But basically, the user group connection is going to be a spin out. Apple is creating an independent company called the user group connection, appropriately enough, consisting of many of the folks you know and love in the user group connection uh, to manage the user group program. The independent company is going to be the user group connection. There's no other. Uh, it's an exclusive relationship. Apple is contracting with the user group connection to deliver the existing Apple authorized user group program. So it should be relatively transparent to user groups that this change is taking place. Fundamentally, it's a change in the capital structure of the organization that delivers the services to you. Apple has made a significant commitment to this new company. That commitment is in the form of incredibly strong financial support. It's in the form of things like facilities. We'll be in an Apple building. We'll be on an Apple phone switch. We'll have our same numbers. Uh, we'll be on the email system. We'll have access to all of the same people, programs, and product informations that we now have. We'll just be financially an independent company. That allows us to do a couple of things. Oh, let me talk about the risk first. I've got a long list of all of the gotchas in this, the things that could really nail us. Um, but when I started making this slide, I thought, you know, there's really only one, and that's the perception of the user group community. And the most important perception that I'm concerned about is the perception that you may feel that you're losing that direct connection with Apple Computer uh, because it'll be managed by a third-party company. I think we've done a lot to put processes in place to maintain that direct connection, especially through the work of the Advisory Council. I also think that some of the things we're doing in the structure of the company make it appear as though we're very nearly Apple employees within the connection. There are a few things you should know about the new user group connection. All of the programs that we now do, things like the Advisory Council, the monthly mailings, uh, the breakfasts that you see here, uh, the events we participate in, our Quick Connect newsletter, the UGTV broadcast, all of those things continue. We're going to do all the programs that we currently do. As a matter of fact, UGTV is scheduled for November, and it's not too early to start thinking about how to get the guy at the pizza parlor to turn the dish over to the right transponder so you can bring your user group down there to watch UGTV in November. Um, there are also a couple of new opportunities in this. The two that we're going to focus on this next year are the purchase program. We believe that there is a huge opportunity to take products like the Performa 400, like the, no promises here, but like the ELSIs, um, products that are reaching end of life, where Apple ends up with inventory at the end, and is looking to get rid of that inventory, I would much rather see that inventory come to user groups at a really hot price than to end up in the price club, discounted uh, for the general public. It's a way to, it's a way to repay uh, the commitment and the support that you all have given to us. So if we're going to do hot pricing, the first place we should do hot pricing is to user groups. And Apple agrees. And, and the second key opportunity is, because we have been inside of Apple, um, we, we have very seldom included third-party information in our mailings. It's just, we just kind of don't do it. Every once in a while, we'll slip something in there uh, if it looks like it has a broader appeal than just 
that particular product, if it's uh, like the Quicken templates for user group financial management, where it's something that helps run the user group in particular. But we've been very uh, uh, firm in keeping third-party information out of our mailing. It makes perfect sense to me to include information from third parties in the mailings that we send to you and demo disks and all that sort of thing. So that's another area where I think we have a great opportunity to, to actually grow our business. Uh, and I think, it's, I think it's incredibly exciting to be in a situation where there's an opportunity to grow something uh, and improve on it and make it better. Um, I guess, uh, I guess the thing I'd like to share with you here is I've had quite a bit of time to think about this. Um, I've had many weeks. I started back in May evaluating this, and I guess I sort of figured, figured out that it was the right thing to do sometime in early July. The User Group Advisory Council came in, and uh, they had a, four days to think about this, and we spent a lot of time talking about how this might work and what we should be looking out for. Um, you all have five minutes <laughs> to sort of absorb this and to formulate any questions. We're at the point in this presentation now where I'm going to go ahead and take questions from you. And I wanted to give you plenty of time to ask your questions. Um, and what we've done is we have the microphone set up uh, in two spots in the room. If you can just make your way up to the microphone and ask the question, I'll be glad to answer them. I just want to let you know, personally, I'm very excited about, about this opportunity, and I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's a chance for us to, to really move forward. Uh, let's see. We have a question behind the post. Um, obviously, Apple's doing this to save money. How are you saving money by doing this if you're spinning out and remaining the same? Well, there's a few things that, there's a few things that go. Uh, one thing that goes is the cost structure that we're burdened by as a part of Apple. Um, you have no idea how much rent I pay for my department as an internal department at Apple. Uh, and uh, um, so we, we have an opportunity to save there. It's, it's less about what goes than how the costs get allocated amongst the people who benefit from the relationship. Um, a lot, of what, a lot of what we're doing involves uh, including third-party vendors. And third-party vendors are, are anxious to participate in a program and glad to support a program to reach user groups. So part of it is spreading the costs across more customers than, than just Apple USA. The other part is we'll be able to work more closely with the product. We're, we've been part of Apple USA uh, all along, and now we'll be able to have stronger relationships and financial support from the product organizations, from AppleSoft, uh, from AOS, and from other parts of Apple, as well as just Apple USA. Ultimately, I think it's going to end up costing Apple about the same amount of money, uh, but I think they're going to get a much better program for user groups. Uh, will your uh, new uh, user group uh, 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 group, uh, separate uh, uh, company, uh, consider offering uh, legal advice to the various user groups as to whether they should be uh, nonprofit or, or profit uh, uh, groups. That is, uh, uh, will you consider the, the, this uh, possible, important uh, possibility? Yeah, we're actually rewriting the 501c3 guide uh, to be released this fall uh, about you know how to maintain your nonprofit status. So. Uh, it's a little touchy to be giving legal advice. We're having a lawyer write it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, we're sort of not on the hook, and he is. Um, but that's, we understand that that's getting a little dated, and so we're coming back out with that, uh, I think, in November or so. Um, one thing I didn't point out was the time frame for all of this. Uh, this is all going to take effect on October 1st. So we're currently in a transition period. And on October 1st, then, the... Uh, the new UGC will take over the, the responsibilities of the user group connection. Final question for you. I'm having a trouble understanding the profitability side of this whole up, of this whole change. Is the goal to be profitable? And if so, do you see a 
time where the financial assistance of Apple is not as important and will and will uh, you'll not need that because you'll then be financially uh, profitable on your own. No, I can't imagine a time when the financial assistance of Apple would not be important for running the Apple authorized user group program. Um, I mean, it's it's got to be there and it's got to be long term. I think the question you may be asking is, are we going to start charging user groups? to belong to the program? Absolutely not. Uh, user groups are not, uh, uh, it's not the place you go for the money. That was, that was something we looked at and said, well, what could we charge them? You know, 25 bucks, 50 bucks. It's like, why bother? Uh, there's not enough money and it's just ill will. Uh, and there, it's the wrong place to charge. Now, if you take a purchase program, one way to charge user groups for this is take the Performa purchase program. We sold 450 Performas. We generated half a million dollars worth of revenue. There's a little bit of margin there. There's not a lot. It's not, it's not a dealership. Uh, but there's a little bit of margin there. So one way user groups can support this activity is by participating in those purchase programs. And we'll work like crazy to drive the prices down and have really hot prices. Uh, but that's one way that that we see revenue coming in. The other ways are from third-party vendors and from Apple itself. And Apple has guaranteed a revenue stream to the company. Okay, now we're gonna move on to a really fun part of the, the program here this morning. Um, I mean, this is incredibly exciting stuff, I think. Uh, the, whole, the whole Newton uh, technology is just moving us that, that step forward. And um, this is one of the most exciting Macworlds I've been to in several years mostly because of the Newton stuff. Uh, what I'd like to do at this point is introduce Michael Chow. Michael is the product planning manager for Newton Technologies. Sure. Michael? Good enough. Thank you very much. Uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit about Newton. And you're very fortunate today because uh, here with me are a bunch of people who are really the people that made Newton happen. And I'd like to introduce you uh, to them. First, presenting with me is James Joaquin, who's manager of core software and tools for Newton. And he'll help, uh, help me put Newton through its paces. James. <laughs> we also have today some of the engineers that made Newton possible, some of the key people uh, that worked on this thing. And I'd like to ask them to stand up in front here. Uh, first, Steve Capps, lead software architect of the Newton product. You may know him as author of the Macintosh Finder. Sound edit, a few uh, applications that, uh, and uh, things that might be familiar to you. Jamina and the Jaminator, yes. The Jaminator Intelligent Guitar. Uh, Walter Smith, architect of the Newton Information Architecture. <laughs> Next up is Andy Stadler, uh, oh, uh, engineer for imaging, Newton Imaging, both printing and on screen. Look at Charles Bit Wizard. Donna August, uh, Software Engineering Manager for Newton. Tim Harrington, OS Engineer. Token Hardware Person and Senior Hardware Architect for, uh, for the Newton System, Michael Colbert. And Newton Toolkit Engineer, Ben Sharp. I guarantee you there isn't a question that this group of august people uh, can't answer. No pun intended. So we're going to go through a quick presentation, get it, turn it over to Q&A, and you can ask all those tough questions, and we could pretend that we didn't hear them. So, OK. So it's important to start with a little context and history before, uh, to, uh, well, before we get to the Newton demonstration, because uh, Ray talked a little bit about some of the changes that are happening at Apple, and these aren't new changes. Uh, and if you think about it, some of the things that we're doing in Newton are a result of the changes. And I can, I can sort of illustrate that by telling you a little bit of history of the Newton group. Everyone always wants to hear about the dark, uh, deep, dark past of the Newton group. So I'll uh, handle that in a, in a very quick summary form. The Newton group was founded in 1987. Remember 1987? Macintosh II, Macintosh SE. Average system price for Apple at that time was $8,000. And at that time, Apple was at the top of, of uh, at a zenith, really. People could not get enough of our product. We were selling Macintosh 2s like there were no tomorrow. And we were the, un, uh, the very clear leader in desktop publishing, uh, doing quite well. 
almost overnight, and it, uh, we, we found that people said, you know, your products are just too expensive. We love your products, but they're just too expensive. And at that time, the Newton Group was working on a product which, if, if we had it to show you today, would be about six pounds about the size and weight of the notebooks that you carry, uh, the size, actually, and shape of the notebooks you carry around, had two AT&T Hobbit RISC processors in it, a ARM processor as an I.O. controller, and a DSP, give you some idea, had two wireless networking systems built into it, had brand new technology for tablets, brand new technology for processor and processor bus, had brand new software technology, everything from the ground up. We made a list of all the things that were brand new uh, and, uh, and serious technical risks for the Newton project, and that was pretty much everything. I think uh, the box, the cardboard box, was a part that we could leverage uh, from technology from, from other places. So really, a start from scratch uh, opportunity, because uh, when the group was started, Jean-Louis Gasset uh, told him to go off and think up the next great information tool. Don't worry about cost. Don't worry about schedule. Just think up the next great thing. Well, when that happens, obviously, you get something like this, the next great thing. Unfortunately, that's a lot of stuff to innovate at once. It's, a lot, it's, uh, it's tough enough to do um, even you know, something like uh, an evolution of the Macintosh product line, where you know the system software base, you know the basic hardware base. But to, to start something from scratch like that was a real challenge. Uh, so right about 1990, uh, as you recall, was an, another very turbulent time for Apple when we were resetting uh, the company around this new low margin structure. If you think about average system price in uh, 1990, when we were introducing the Classic and the LC, not $8,000 anymore, not $8,000 with, uh, with uh, 55 and 65% gross margin, but a lot lower cost structure. In order to do that, we were also looking out at the world and seeing where we could leverage, where we could leverage to get lower cost products and to, to focus on our innovation, which we believe is system software technology. At that time, uh, um, John Scully stepped up to the bar as our chief technical officer. And while there were a lot of snickers from a lot of people, his first goal was to reevaluate every project that, uh, that Apple had going on at the time. And that were projects like uh, the Newton Project, uh, the project called Jaguar, which ultimately became the PowerPC uh, systems that you'll see, a uh, project called Pink, which ultimately was spun out into Intelligent, and a range of other projects that were going on at Apple. And the goal was to evaluate those on their merits uh, and decide what to do with them. Should we go on with them? Should we stop them? Should we partner with other people to deliver them? And the Newton Group came under a lot of fire because uh, as, as, a, as a pirate group, a lot of people really didn't know what was going on there. And John Scully sent in Larry Tester, who was then head of ATG, to look at the group and say, what, what's usable there? What's, what are they doing over there? And what can we either move to ATG or take to product development? And in fact, uh, in fact, in point of fact, one of the goals of that investigation was to actually break up the Newton Group and to move it into different places within Apple because the thought was what they're building over there is, really isn't a product. Well, Larry came back and said, well, I think there's a lot of great technology there. In fact, I don't think, I think you should uh, take the Newton Group and bring, it, uh, bring that Newton technology into a product. And not only that, I would like to leave my position as head of ATG and run the group, which was well, a bit of a surprise to the Newton Group and uh, a bit of a surprise to John as well. So that was the beginning of a restart of the Newton project around a uh, much lower de uh, cost design center. And that was actually the first time they hired um, other than engineering people to work in the group. And I was, uh, that was the time that I joined the group around uh, summer of 1990, was it? Spring, summer of 1990? 91? I don't know what to call All these years blur together. Uh, <laughs> so at that time, we reset uh, the design of the system, both, uh, well, primarily hardware, to take this $8,000 box and deliver something that was going to be under $2,000. And that, imagine, I mean, imagine taking your design center and, and uh, dramatically changing it. We switched processors from the, from the AT&T Hobbit to the ARM. We uh, redesigned a system that would be uh, smaller and cheaper to manufacture. And began on the road to developing a system that was based at that time on the Dylan language. Uh, again, in many ways, we had reset the hardware design, but we hadn't really reset the software goals. We were still looking at a very ambitious component architecture system based on Dylan. Right around uh, March of 91, uh, so a small group of people said, you know, what we'd really like to do is get out first with something that's small and really inexpensive and really leverage a lot of the technologies you can see in the consumer electronics industry. Because 
uh, you could see a lot of really interesting digital consumer electronics available at really attractive prices. And we said if our innovation is really in software, maybe we can take that hardware, integrate it really well, and bring out um, some pretty neat hardware. And that was the genesis of this project, which was codenamed Junior, and eventually uh, made its uh, way out as the Newton Message Pad, which when we introduced uh, the technologies in May of 92, our expectation was at that time that we would ship that product at the end of 1992. And I'm here to tell you that we didn't ship that product at the end of 1992. Uh, and, but we're shipping it now, and we're pretty pleased to be doing that. And what we developed uh, in that time was a whole new architecture for this uh, class of devices. And really, with a much smaller focus, small, uh, a focus on small, a focus on low cost, a focus on low margin, and a whole new business model, which we believe will be the mo uh, you know, a very new and interesting model for Apple because we know that we're going to license this technology, which is very new for Apple. We know that we've already licensed the technology to Sharp, to Motorola, to Panasonic. So you'll see a number of Newton products from a range of other people, and that's very new for us. We know that our, uh, that our money, our revenue, will come not only from hardware sales but from software and services sales. And uh, that's also very new from Apple, because you think of Apple as a company that sells you boxes, and that's how they make their money. Well, the box business is very, very competitive, and there's very little margin in it. But over time, if we can establish a relationship with you, you'll hopefully come back and buy new software. You'll hopefully come back and buy services. And our goal is a whole new platform where you'll do that much more often. Because instead of just buying one spreadsheet, one word processor, and one database, you want to constantly update your system with, with uh, inexpensive software that's very personalized and customized to you. And that's what the Newton architecture is all about. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the technologies that are part of Newton and, uh, and how we see them. We look at the software and silicon technologies in Newton, and we call it Newton Intelligence. And you might say, what is that? Well, Newton Intelligence is, uh, you might think of as the operating system in Newton, but we don't call it the operating system, and there are two key reasons. One is because Newton Intelligence incorporates more than what would be traditionally considered a, a personal computer operating system. And the second is because we ultimately see this technology going into a much wider range of products, not just notepad-like devices like the message pad, but intelligent phones, intelligent fax machines, car dashboards, uh, and intelligent VCRs. And you may chuckle now, but the design of the, the hardware and software architecture is designed to go down, to mo move down in cost and to become pervasive and ubiquitous because what we want to offer to customers is that same kind of intelligence that's in the, you see sort of a twinkle of in the Newton message pad today. We want to add that to another, a, a wide range of devices so that, that those devices can be smarter, um, easier to use, and more fun. Simple. And, but it's a different way of looking at designing hardware and software, very different from a personal computer operating system. So what are the key components of Newton Intelligence? Uh, the key components are the recognition architecture, and that's a modular recognition system that recognizes not only text printed and cursive, but also graphics and gestures. And over time, you'll be able to add capabilities to recognize any kind of gestural notation, like musical notes or electronic symbols, or et cetera. And we believe our recognition, our handwriting recognition technology is the best that's out there. Again, we can recognize printed and cursive, which is the first time I believe any product shipped out of the box with that capability. And it also, over time, it adapts to your handwriting style by watching the characters you write and adapting uh, itself to it. And that's, and that's pretty cool. We'll show you how that works. Second thing is the information architecture. For those of you that are technical out there, which is a fair number, that is the key innovation in, uh, in the Newton system because it makes possible a lot of very interesting things in, in terms of the way we manage information, the way we store it, the way developers can get at it, et cetera. Because all information in Newton is stored in a single object-oriented database, what we call the data soup. That database is fully programmable. It has full access to uh, communications capabilities, et cetera. And all developers can read and write to that, that, that single database without having to transfer or translate from different file formats. That means the user doesn't see these hard wall containers, which we call documents now. If you think about your Macintosh, you see a MacWrite document, you, think, uh, you see an Excel document, you see a PageMaker document, and those are all stored in proprietary file formats. You probably spend a fair amount of your time translating and transferring information back and forth. If you're in the middle of Excel and you say, you know, I want that name that's in my MacWrite file, you have to launch MacWrite. It's not very easy to access that information. Whereas any application written for the Newton system has the ability to look into that data soup and also view information and, and use information for that data soup, as well as write to it. 
So I can write an application that adds things to my calendar. I can write an, uh, an application that pulls information out of my dates file. And that's going to be very, very powerful, especially if you see how we've taken that cross-platform on the Macintosh and PC for something for Newton Connection. Third thing is the Newton Communications architecture. And that's basically our, you know, our understanding that Newton is ultimately going to be a communications product. And it starts today as a communications product, but we know that out there are people with, who are investing billions of dollars developing digital information highways, whether they be uh, PCS services, whether they be uh, a cellular a CDPD network, whether they be uh, packet radio or two-way paging or paging, et cetera. We know that there are going to be lots and lots of both wired and wireless highways out there, all of them with information that you want to get from place to place. Well, Newton is designed to connect to those highways, even though they're not here yet, by simply dropping in modules that allow you to, to talk to those networks and, more importantly, do intelligent things with the information that comes across those highways. So you'll see a little bit of that today, and you'll see a lot more of that in the coming years because those new highways are just about to go online. Last point is something called Newton Intelligent Assistance, and we think that's a fundamentally different way of looking at how we can help the user, because we apply some of the brains of Newton to actually trying to understand what you're trying to do and help you out. Remember back in 84 when we came out with the Macintosh and we talked about the fact that the 68000 was a 32-bit architecture processor, and everyone said, well, what are, you use, what are you using that for? That means I guess you can calculate pi really, really quickly. And our, our, our focus there was to spend a lot of that processing power to putting up this graphical user interface, which helped people use the system much more easily. Well, Newton takes the next step there. It uses some of its brains, a 32-bit risk processor, to make the system easier to use, to make it understand what the user is doing to help it be more intelligent. So you know, our goal isn't 3D spinning cubes uh, or, or something like that. We use the power of Newton to help you with your communications tasks and to try to understand what you're doing to take the next step. We think intelligent assistance is going to be something that developers can go crazy on. And it's going to change the type of application and the way you actually get things done on a Newton device. Because when you're on the road, when you're mobile, you don't want to be tweaking things. You want, you want the machine to do things for you. So you know, while you're at your desktop laying out your newsletter, you want to be able to, you know, I want to kern to one ten thousandth of an M space. When I'm, I'm, when, I'm on my, when I'm on the road, I want to say, you know what a business letter looks like. Take care of that for me. And that's what Newton's able to do. And that fundamental, you know, place that we start separates the Newton architecture from personal computer architectures. Personal computer architectures are very document focused. Newton architecture is very idea and communications focused. Okay, this, for those of you who have purchased Newtons, this is probably something you haven't seen yet. And if you have, let me tell you, you have voided your warranty. <laughs> <clears throat> this is the Newton message pad motherboard. And it's important to understand that this is a price performance breakthrough. Inside this box is the same processing horsepower as a Macintosh 2FX, about one to one and a half times the same performance. Uh, we actually find that the code that runs on this, we were actually uh, talking about this with one of our developers, the code that runs on this actually, in some cases, runs faster than it runs on a 50 megahertz 486 desktop machine. So in something you can buy today for around $699 is the power of some of the most powerful desktop computers and it runs on batteries, and uh, it weighs less than a pound. And that's pretty revolutionary. Now, if you think about other people talking about entering the PDA marketplace, oh, we have our PDA too, and I won't mention any names, but a lot of those products are based on derivatives of 8088 class processors. We're talking about you know, dark ages technology. We're talking original IBM PC. Now, we're t you know, compare it to, in terms of raw processing performance, just, even if you just talk about processing performance, what we have going for us with, with this architecture. The reason why we chose this new architecture is because we could make breakthroughs in price performance. Because we know, and we've heard this from you, is that while we've always offered better products at Apple, we've, we've often had to charge a premium to build all those extra things in, to build SCSI in, to build local talk in, et cetera. So this time we said, we're going to use our brilliant software people and our brilliant hardware people to figure out how to make good performance actually costs less than performance. So <laughs> that's what this architecture is all about. It's about squeezing stuff down so it runs in less RAM, squeezing stuff down so it runs out of ROM. It's about choosing a processor that gives you great performance and very low price. Uh, I'm going to point at the wrong one, and Colbert's going to kill me. This is the ARM 610 processor, which has the, thank you, thank you so much. I got it right. The ARM 610 has a built-in memory management unit, which is designed and optimized to help our software run well. And it's also, as I said, has pretty high performance and runs off of, uh, with very low power. It wins the MIPS per watt war. 
and that's its firm that Mike Colbert coined. Here to the right is the Newton System Services ASIC. As you know, Apple loves integrating stuff down into chips because it saves cost, it saves board space, it saves power, and it allows us to deliver a more reliable system as well. This System Services ASIC essentially is, contains all the functionality of Newton, uh, tablet driver, uh, uh, you know, tablet control, system glue, PCMCIA slots, stuff, et cetera. And here is your, our, our favorite part, the uh, trusty SCC. Uh, two ROM chips a bunch of static RAM chips. That's pretty much it. So if you think about it, there's not much here. And that means that we can offer this stuff at uh, relatively attractive prices. And we can drive it down in cost over time. We're not just going to wait to see our components uh, come down. We're going to be able to drive this down in uh, cost of architecture so you can see it in phones and fax machines, <coughs> et cetera. OK, so that's the hardware architecture. Let's flip it over, and you'll see. Um, this is the 9600, uh, actually 19.2, thank you, infrared transceiver, which uh, sends information over a distance of about a meter. This is the uh, traditional Apple uh, Mini 8 serial port, power, tablet uh, connector, power switch, PCMCIA slot in case you missed that, uh, et cetera. On your, on your serial port, you also have local talk built in. Right. Um, so it's a pretty uh, compact, uh, stylish, and affordable. Logic board. That's new. Okay. So that's a little bit about the hardware. Uh, and the, by now, you probably all know, know all about the specifications of the device, so I'm not going to get into those. But what, what we're going to do is take you on a quick tour for those of you who haven't seen Newton, or for those of you in TV land who haven't had a chance to co co go to over to Symphony Hall. I encourage you all to go over there and take a look at what's, uh, what's, what's there. We'll d give you a quick uh, demonstration. And for those of you in the audience who have Newtons, you can follow along. <laughs> show you how Newton works. OK, we're going to take you on a fast-paced tour through the Newton. And um, we'll have Q&A afterwards. So if we blaze through something, uh, be sure and ask us about it later. Now, when we first turn the Newton on, we see a part of the Newton called the notepad. And this is an area that's designed to work just like a paper notepad and a pen or a pencil. It lets you quickly capture text, graphics, <coughs> etc. I can use these up and down arrows at the bottom of the screen to scroll through the notepad. I'm going to scroll down through some notes I've already created. Here's one that you'll notice is still left in the handwriting style. Someone actually beamed that to me, a little hello note. And we'll come down to a blank page, and we'll show you some of the different ways you can take notes on your Newton. So Newton's all about capturing, organizing, and communicating your ideas and information. So uh, we'll start with the sort of the capture part, and the three key ways to get information into your Newton uh, in, from the capture side. The first is electronic ink. So you can see, as you write on Newton, Newton keeps your stuff in electronic ink. It's actually storing that as ink objects. It's capturing stroke data. And it's automatically compressing that data so that it takes up less space in your memory. So now, even as you've captured electronic ink, Newton is smart about that ink. So unlike paper and pencil, Newton understands the different objects that you've, that you've drawn. So for example, I can select some information here. I can then move it or resize it. Like so, Newton makes the changes automatically. Or if I want to remove this object, just scratch it out. Newton deletes it from the note. One of the one of the great kind. One of the great contributions of uh, Steve Caps. I think. It, I think uh, someone told me that every great software engineer is also a frustrated musician, and uh, certainly Steve Caps would be the ultimate uh, software engineer and frustrated musician. <laughs> and I think you can th uh, when we were designing the system, covered myself and uh, Caps, he said, uh, well, should it have a little beep thing, or should it have a real speaker in it? And Caps said, it's got to have a speaker in it. And even though it costs a little bit more, that allows us to put uh, a few interesting sound effects and a lot more coming down the road. So. So one other thing uh, we'd like to show you about uh, electronic ink notes is that you have the capability of filing them. So any note in your Newton can be filed under any category that you specify. And you also have the ability to communicate those notes. So when I tap on that envelope, I get a list of communications options. So that envelope we call the routing slip, or the action button. And it allow you'll see that anywhere in Newton, you can print, fax, beam, or mail an item. And that's an important thing. When you talk about how, you are, how we are able to be a communications assistant, you'll see that communications isn't this other place you go, this other application you launch, and this thing you do, and then come back to your work. Everything that's in Newton is designed to be communicatable. So you'll see this routing slip everywhere. OK, let's start a new note on our notepad. And the way we do that is just draw a line across the notepad. Newton says, oh, you'd like a new page. 
gives us a new page. Time and date stamps our notes automatically so we can keep track of them chronologically. Second way of entering information into the Newton is what we call intelligent keyboards. And if you tap on the keyboard icon, you can go uh, bring up a, a keyboard that understands what you're trying to, to uh, what kind of information you're trying to input. So in this case, we're in the notepad, which is very free form, so you get a standard typewriter style keyboard. If we tap on the keyboard icon, we can cycle through some other keyboards that are designed for specific kinds of information. So if you're entering numbers in a form, you could get a numerical keypad. Perhaps you're typing in a phone number. We also have a phone keypad even one for times and dates. So again, if you're entering information into the card file, like a phone number, it'll bring up a phone keypad automatically. And that's a uh, flag you can also set in Newton Toolkit for the applications you develop. Now, Michael mentioned the recognition architecture, one of the powerful pieces of software inside the Newton. Now we'd like to show you exactly how that works, how you can use that, again, to quickly capture information. You'll see these two buttons here at the bottom of the notepad. This is for text and graphics recognition. And I'm going to turn both of those on right now. And now James can write and either write in cursive or printed or a mixture of uh, cursive and printed, and Newton re recognizes and translates his writing into typed text. As Newton recognizes the words, it automatically forms paragraphs for me. So now you can select that uh, series of words and move it, reformat it, search through it, et cetera. Now, when we first got this working, we were all pretty amazed that we could do this, but we didn't stop there. We knew that people... <laughs> Just how amazed were we? <laughs> we, uh, we realized that people also like to draw. When you take notes, you don't just write words in paragraphs. You write words in different places on the page, you sketch, etc. So we wanted to make a system that understood what you drew and tried to clean it up for you to assist you in making sketches and drawings. So you can see as you draw a box or a circle, Newton cleans it up for you. You don't have to go and select the box tool or the circle tool or figure out how in God's name you're going to do your drawing with the uh, rounded rectangle tool. That's right. um, you can just draw as you would, and Newton understands it. And it's not just understanding um, these predetermined shapes. It, also, it, it actually looks at the strokes you write and tries to apply rules of symmetry to clean up what you've drawn. So if you draw something a little bit more complex, and we'd like to draw an arrow here, Newton does its best to figure out what you've drawn and make it symmetrical. Once you have that, you can circle it and perform a couple of manipulations on it. So Newton's smart about these graphics. Even if I had drawn this arrow with separate lines, it knows how to group them as an arrow. I can resize it. I can even change the shape of the graphic just by dragging on those points. You can see that Newton's very, very fast uh, as he moves and resizes that information. It's all updated uh, right there on the screen. Uh, you can move that information really, really easily. That's because we have the performance of the ARM 610, and uh, we also have our uh, fast imaging model and uh, tightly integrated software. So it all works really, really quickly as compared to other systems which don't. OK, so you've seen how we can use this performance to quickly capture information. The next thing that people want to do once you've got information on your Newton is you want to organize it. So for any note on our notepad, we can file this away, again, by tapping on the folder icon, choosing the folder we want to file this in. And you, the user, can specify the folders that you want. So you can make the system personal, customized to the way you want to manage your stuff. And it is stuff. It is stuff. Uh, to view information in a folder, just go to the top tab, tap that, you get the list of all your folders, and you can go into those folders and look at the information you've stored there. So I'm going to choose the correspondence folder, take a look at some letters that we've written on this Newton. Okay. Scroll down, and you'll see my favorite letter. It says our, our standard demo letter, which is, there you go, which is a, uh, a note that, uh, that I created to James when I was on the plane. And I actually wrote this in on a United flight back from Australia. And this is the safety message, which indicates how to use the all-important uh, the all-important seatbelt function of, uh, of this United 747, because many people often forget that the metal fitting goes into the buckle. Uh, so <laughs> wanted to make, since James travels a lot with me, I wanted to make sure that he understood how to use this important piece of safety uh, equipment, so wrote it out, and we're going to fax it to him and show you how Newton's information architecture is integrated with a communications architecture to make sending and receiving information really easy. So we'll show you how Newton can act as an assistant, much like a personal assistant could help you take these rough notes and turn them into a business fax, Newton can do that for you as well. So we'll highlight the recipient, and again, we'll go to our routing slip and choose fax. Newton's smart enough to go into uh, James's, uh, my, actually my Rolodex, and look up the person to send it to, in this case, James Joaquin. 
it knows that we're in Boston, so it automatically uh, puts a one there in front so that to dial the number out uh, to Boston and uh, gives a few options for formatting that information. Because even though you're carrying around something which has, that you want to fit in your pocket and have a small screen so that it will fit in your pocket, you don't want to send little pocket-sized notes to someone's fax machine. So we're going to choose a business letter because we want Newton to, again, act as an assistant, turn this into a business letter for us. So it grabs the, uh, the address of the person we're sending this to. Again, we can also make a cover page automatically. If we tap Preview, we'll get an on-screen preview of what this is going to look like coming out of the fax machine. So Newton's automatically created a fax machine with my name and fax number and James's name and fax number, the number of pages, and a space for notes. When we tap Next, we'll see that Newton's taken the letter. We'll put it on your stationery, put today's date, the name and address of the person you're sending it to, and take those rough notes and reformat them so they look professional on a business page. So this is an example of what we call intelligent assistance. Newton has actually looked at what you wanted to do and take the next step. Rather than you having to do it, Newton is taking care of it for you. So imagine, so to contrast tool and assistant, imagine you said you wanted to do this. You were on the plane, you wrote a letter to a friend, you say, you come back to your office, you hand it to your assistant, and you say, okay, could you please send this fax to Bob? And instead of doing it for you, your assistant came into your office and handed you a typewriter, your Rolodex, a fax machine, a big pad of paper, and a big bottle of whiteout. And said, there you go. You have all the tools you need to get the job done. You'd say, now exactly what did I hire you for? That's your highly paid assistant. My highly paid assistant. So Newton acts as your electronic assistant to help you get things done, to help you take the next step. So Michael's still on the plane. He's finished this letter. He's ready to fax it. He simply taps the fax button here. <laughs> This is where I come in and say, Newton stores that information in your out basket until you get and connect to the phone line. And once you can, Newton can send all the queued up faxes, all the queued mail messages that you need to send, all the print jobs to the printer that you want to connect to. So it stores all that information waiting for you to get back and connect to a device that allows you to connect to it. OK, now we're going to show you some of the other built-in applications in the message pad. Again, we built this to help you organize your personal information and communicate it. We put some smart applications in the product to help you do that. First, I'll tap on the Names button here. This brings up our Names file. It's a, in a sense, it's a Rolodex. I can use the arrows to flip through my business cards. I can also tap the Overview button between the arrows to get an A through Z listing of the contents of my address book. Tapping on any card takes me there. And you'll see even here in the names file, we have the same capabilities to file information. So we can file cards under different categories. And also to communicate that information. So you can print, fax, beam, mail, et cetera. Okay, one of the things we like to show is beaming of information, because we think this is going to be a great way to exchange information between Newton users. Next time we come back here, we expect all you guys to have Newtons, and you'd be beaming your business cards and notes, et cetera. And right now, about you'd say, you know, you'd be saying, isn't this, isn't this going on a little long? Um, so here's what I'm going to do is show you how you might do that. Um, turn, on your, turn on my Newton, bring up a card. A couple days ago, actually a couple weeks ago, I was in Aspen for the Aspen Design Conference, and uh, I visited a place called Aspen Paragliding, which is uh, a place that uh, offers paragliding lessons, sport of the 90s. Uh, now, that after we've d done one death-defying act, we'd like to try a few others. So what I'll do is I'll beam that card to James. All I have to do is tap beam, point my Newton at James's. You can see that, well, you can see that Newton automatically opens up the end basket and receives that information. And what's more, Newton is intelligent about the type of information you're receiving, so it knows to how to put it away in the appropriate place. So if you beam someone a note, it automatically appears on your, uh, on your, note, uh, on your notepad. If you beam someone a business card, it automatically appears on their uh, business card file. If you beam someone a calendar, it automatically appears on their calendar. So without any wires, Michael just zapped me this business card into my Newton. I see it's shown up here automatically. And one of the nice things about the way the names file works is we designed it to work the way people work in, in, in their, with their own business cards, their own physical cards. So people like to flip cards over, take notes on the back. We let you do that with Newton as well. So I can choose to show card and notes, flip that card over and see any notes that Michael has taken. And, and here, lo and behold, he's actually provided a map for me so I can find this place and I don't get lost in Aspen. So another way Newton helps you stay in touch or communicate with others is through dialing. So Newton does an intelligent thing to help you dial phone numbers. So wherever you see a phone number in the card file, just tap on it, and Newton brings up a call slip to help you make that call. You can either dial that call through the modem or uh, actually hold the handset up to the speaker, and Newton will generate the DTMF dialing tones to place the call. 
So we don't stop there. Um, that helps you make the call, but uh, we found that a lot of uh, busy people tend to travel a lot, and phone dialing becomes a nightmare when you travel from state to state or from country to country. So built into Newton is something called dialing assistance, and dialing assistance understands sort of where you are and how to place a call to where you want to call. So if we go into uh, the uh, world clock and pick a city. I'm feeling kind of in a Paris mood. Today. A Paris mood, okay. Let's say we're gonna, go, we're gonna fly to Paris. Get on the plane, tap I'm here. Newton does two things. First, it automatically resets the internal clock of the Newton so that all your time and date stamping happens at the right time, all your alarms happen at the right time. And uh, when you tap the, to make that call again, Newton understands the dialing codes, how, how do they reach the United States from Paris, and automatically appends those to the numbers so you don't have to remember. Now, I'll plot. It's a very fabulous feature. But wait, there's more. <laughs> if you order today, yes, yes. Tap on the options, you can uh, put prefixes like nine, credit cards, long distance access codes, and those will automatically be appended to your number as well. Voila. Okay, now we'd like to show you how you manage your time with Newton. Tapping on the dates button brings up our built-in calendar. It also has an integrated to-do list. Which we'll get to. Right. So switching back to the calendar, first thing you see is that Newton opens up to today's date automatically, gives you a, a nine to five time range, and you can use these arrows again to scroll up. There's our user group breakfast, or scroll down to, uh, to look at your uh, evening schedule. And when you tap on a uh, duration bar, you get uh, a notes area, which allows you to take notes about the meeting, where it is, again, text or graphics here. And you also have some powerful uh, alarm and frequency capabilities. So tapping on alarm lets us set a reminder for this meeting, a number of minutes, hours, or days in advance. Newton will actually power itself on and sound a beep reminding you that you have a meeting coming up. One of the things that's really important to people is the ability to schedule recurring meetings. And we go out of our way to let you do that uh, by providing an infinite array of uh, meetings, uh, multiple meeting capabilities. So this meeting can happen every week on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, every other week, uh, every month, every day of year, or every first, third, and last Thursday, if that's how you happen to schedule your meetings. Newton will automatically schedule those recurring meetings for you. Again, here in the calendar, you have the same communications capabilities. So as Michael said, you don't have to go to a separate application to share information with other people. It's built into Newton everywhere you go. You can print, fax, mail, etc. Let's zip ahead to the to-do list and show you that built into the calendar is a to-do list that allows you to write uh, in things that you have to do, prioritize them. Notice that up there, well, I think, think call Liz is up. This, uh, this wedding is actually coming up soon. I better... Uh, I think I better arrange travel for that pretty soon. So uh, I'm going to change the priority here, make this a priority one item. You'll see Newton rearranges the list for me automatically. Once you're through with an item, just check it off. Newton leaves it on the day you've completed it so that you can look back at your month and say, this is what I've done. If you haven't completed it, Newton automatically rolls it to the next day to remind you to do it. <laughs> kind of a digital nag, if you will. <laughs> should trademark that. OK. Another, th another thing we found when we, when we looked at how people work with, uh, with their time, with their calendars, is that everybody does it differently. So we tried to make Newton's calendar really flexible. So if you like to see more than one day at once, just select them in the month view. Newton shows you your calendar side by side. And up in the upper left-hand corner is an area we call the notes area. That allows you to schedule information that uh, doesn't happen on, uh, at a particular time, but happens on a particular day, like Sue's birthday, as an example. And I can also set alarms to, let me, to remind me of that birthday a couple days in advance, so I can remember to buy a card or, uh, or a present, as an example. It's all built in. Of course, if you want your month at a glance, tap on the month. You see your entire month's calendar on the screen. So now you've seen some of the built-in capabilities. We'll show you how information is integrated uh, in the system and how intelligent assistance helps you take messages that you might get and act on them intelligently. So this is the Newton messaging card. Uh, and the Newton messaging card uses paging frequencies to receive information wirelessly. So I can receive text messages uh, over this message card simply by plugging it into the top of, of, uh, of my Newton. Now, the message pad actually, the, the messaging card actually receives messages even when it's outside of the unit. So I don't have to have it plugged in to receive those messages. All I need to do is plug it in. It automatically loads those, uh, those messages into my in basket so I can view them. 
Now, let's say I got a message like this, just a typical type of message I get. Call Catherine. She wants to know if you can have lunch with uh, Steve on Monday. Is that what it says? That's, That's what it exactly says. what it says. So let's say I want to do that. Newton Intelligent Assistance understands key phrases to help me get that done. So I can just highlight uh, call Catherine, tap assist. Newton's smart enough to look in my Rolodex and bring up Catherine's number so I can place that call. Newton also remembers that we're still in Paris. So again, it adds the uh, country codes for us automatically. <laughs> you look a little more French out there than, than, uh, than before. OK, but Newton goes beyond that. Newton also understands other key phrases like lunch, dinner, meet, schedule, remind, and can act on those as well. So after I've had, uh, made the call, I say, yeah, I want to have lunch with Steve on Monday. I'll just select that area of the note, tap assist again. Newton looks up uh, through that message to find words that it understands and, pro uh, and proposes this as a, as a meeting. Uh, lunch with Steve Anker on the next available Monday, uh, puts in noon as a, as a default time, and allows me to enter where and, uh, and uh, select a subject. So Newton has, has brought up the first Steve that it found in our address book, and we can simply tap on who here. And it shows us a list of the Steves. And, and in this case, uh, I'd rather have lunch with Steve Caps. No offense to Steve Anker. Uh, so I can change that very easily. Again, change the time of lunch if I'd like, but I like Newton's default of noon. And tap schedule. Newton puts it on my calendar automatically. So you can see Newton Intelligent Assistance actually can act on messages that come in uh, or they're going out and take action for you based on key words and phrases that it knows. And as a developer, you can add to those phrases. For instance, we demonstrated at, uh, at our keynote that uh, an application developer has added understandings of things like Hertz and Hilton, et cetera. So when you write in expenses on your notepad, you can highlight them, tap assist, and they'll automatically uh, be added to your expense report in the appropriate category. So you'll see it's changing the way people develop software and how they integrate information across applications. So the last thing we'd like to show you is that uh, it's also very easy to remove information from your Newton. So if we come back to this note that we created at the, uh, the beginning of the presentation, if we want to get rid of it, again, we just go to our routing slip. We choose delete. <laughs> Newton puts it in the trash for us. OK, so let's review a couple of uh, communications points. First, you can print. Printing, you can uh, print to Direct Connect serial printers like the Style Writer, Style Writer 1, Style Writer 2. You can also print to uh, dir Direct Connected parallel printers using the Newton Print Pack. Newton Print Pack is an intelligent printer cable, which actually has built into it a microprocessor and ROM, which allows it to download the drivers for printers like the LaserJet, the Pro Printer, Epson FX. All you need to do is carry around this intelligent printer cable wherever you go, plug it into the printer, it downloads the appropriate driver to print to, and you can print to that, uh, that uh, parallel printer. Third thing is you can print to laser writers uh, you, that are on local talk using, uh, using a local talk connection. So you can even print across multiple zones. What we demonstrate in Cupertino is that since uh, all of Apple does, is wired, I can plug in anywhere in Cupertino and print to Paris because our, our uh, offices are hooked up through, uh, through Apple Talk. So since Apple, Apple Talk, which supports multiple zones, is built into this system, we have full uh, local talk printing capabilities. Second thing is faxing. You saw how we can automatically generate fax cover pages, send a fax at 9600 baud, uh, automatically post format information. And we can also uh, send information using Newton Mail. Newton Mail allows you to do essentially what beaming does across the room, across the country. So you can select any item that's in Newton and send it to any other Newton user. And when, it, when, it, there is, when they receive it, Newton is intelligent enough to know what kind of information it is and put it away. So you don't have to copy a person's business card information out of a text file and figure out how to, how to stick it in your, your business card file. Just tap put away, and Newton will put that business card into your Rolodex file automatically for you. The Newton messaging card is this uh, wireless messaging card that, uh, again, supports paging frequencies. Because it supports paging frequencies, it features full in-building coverage. So you don't have to hold it up to the window or wave it over your head in order to receive information. It just receives information like a, like a good pager would. And again, uh, we expect to see uh, headline news information, sports scores, stock quotes coming across this pager. Actually, I have headline news coming in uh, today. The green light's flashing, which means I probably have today's news update. Uh, beam information to, uh, to any other Newton over a distance of about a meter at 19.2. It also supports uh, transferring information to Sharp 9600 series wizards. Let's see, what else did I leave out? Uh, modems. Uh, the uh, communication system bundle comes with this external modem, which features uh, built-in cable management. It's powered off of batteries, so it doesn't drain the power of the message pad while you're using it. Automatically switches on and off, so there are no switches you have to deal with. 
And uh, it's designed to be very low cost, so we can offer it attractively as a bundle price. So we expect a lot of people will buy it. In fact, what I'm hearing now is that connect rate on the modem is about 99%. So most people who can are buying the, uh, the, the communication system bundles. We'll also, over time, offer a card modem. And this is a PCMCIA card modem that fits in the top slot of your uh, Newton, like so. And it does take up the slot when you're using it. And it also does draw power off the Newton's battery. So your battery life will be lower if you use this. But it does have a convenient pop-out RJ11 jack so that you can plug directly into, uh, into it without having to plug in. It's kind of fun. Go through some of the other accessories that we have here. Is that we think a lot of people will buy the Newton, the exciting Newton rechargeable battery pack and recharger. It's a clever name we came up with for a <laughs> rechargeable battery and the charger that the rechargeable battery plugs into. Uh, it has a little pop-out connector so you can plug it into your wall. We uh, make it very inexpensive so you can leave it in hotel rooms everywhere. <laughs> Also, as part of our scalable power architecture, we have the Newton Battery Booster Pack. The Newton Battery Booster Pack uh, supports eight uh, AA uh, alkaline cells and uh, increases up six to eight times the battery life of your Newton message pad. So you'll never be without your Newton no matter what you do or where you go. Can you uh, talk about battery life? Oh, yes, battery life uh, with the basic system with alkalins should be, uh, we expect that average users will get about two weeks worth of life off of alkalins, about a week's worth of life out of NICADs. Again, your mileage may vary. See your authorized re Apple reseller for details. Um, we also make available the one megabyte uh, SRAM storage card and the two megabyte flash storage card. Uh, and those store surprisingly one megabyte of information for the one megabyte card, two megabytes for the two megabyte card. <laughs> Um, Clever see. naming once again. Uh, oh, uh, the Newton comes with a wide range of things in, uh, built in. For those of you who have, have them, there's a videotape, a getting started card, which has a game, uh, a guided tour, and a handwriting tutorial. Uh, the getting started card is uh, uh, cleverly marked getting started. And uh, it also comes with a uh, power adapter. We're very pleased with the power adapter. You would think it's difficult to get excited about our power adapter. But our power adapter is actually smaller and lighter than the product itself. And <laughs> in fact, there are other uh, devices out there which have power adapters which are actually heavier and larger than the Newton message pad. So we're pleased about that. It's wide ranging, goes from 100 to 240 volts. So all you have to do is plug it into a simple adapter to take it worldwide. It's designed to fit in only one slot in a power strip. For, so for those of you who have power strips, that's really nice. The same power adapter powers your Newton message pad and your modem. And it com one comes with a system, but you can always buy another once again in case you leave one in a hotel room or if you want to power your modem so you they're uh, also available separately. Let's see. Oh, yes, there's a fine selection of carrying cases in both natural and synthetic fibers. Um, <laughs> The message pad comes with uh, the fine leather et slip case, and this is the uh, leather carrying case, which feature, features fine Corinthian leather both on the inside and outside. Rich Corinthian leather. Rich Corinthian leather, that's right. Uh, one of the things, uh, all kidding aside, we want to get to one of the really important parts to you guys, which is Newton Connection. We know that, especially you and a lot of our first users, will be users of personal computers. And they want to make it very e we want to make it very easy for them to move their information back and forth between their Newton and their personal computer. So like to, what we've developed is something called Newton Connection, which we believe is really a breakthrough in being able to move information back and forth and do it intelligently. And we've, we're providing Newton Connection for both the Macintosh and for Windows. Um, so no matter what kind of personal computer you have, you can link your Newton to it very seamlessly. This may be a little presumptuous, but I just made a hunch that you might want to see the Macintosh version here today. So that's what we're going to show you. Uh, if we can switch the uh, screen over. And um, we're going to quickly take you through a lot of the capabilities of this application, because as Michael said, it's really an important part of Newton as a platform. And it's important for you folks, since you are computer users. Uh, you'll see there's three uh, buttons here that, that show you the basic capabilities of the application, the three most common things you might do. The first is synchronize. Uh, once you have your Newton data transferred to your Mac, that's very useful because, it, for one, it lets you back up that information. Newton Connection goes further and lets you edit it, lets you create new Newton information on the desktop. The next time you plug your Newton in, the information on your Mac and your Newton are automatically synchronized. So new information in both places is transferred automatically. So this is a really important plug for the Newton information architecture because remember how we talked about all information being stored in this object-oriented database. What that means is since we've moved that, uh, that information architecture to the Mac and to the PC, we can synchronize down to the record level. 
So think about your pow your power if you're a PowerBook user, and if you write a MacWrite document as an example, and while you're out of the office, your associate is updating that same MacWrite document. It's impossible to know and incorporate updates so that both of the changes are incorporated. The only way you can do that is by looking at the, the modif last modification date and replacing the document based on that. With Newton Connection, you actually have the ability to, if someone changes a business card while you, and another person changes a calendar entry, while your associate while you're out of the office, as an example, or adds a new business card, when you plug your Newtons and your, together with your Macintosh, both of your systems are brought up to date with the most up to date information. Also with Newton Connection, you can restore information to your Newton. So if you want to uh, restore to a backup file, or if you want to, you're just starting out and uh, a friend or a coworker gives you a file of business contacts that you want to put into your Newton, you can do that easily. Also with Newton Connection, you can install what we call packages. Packages are software bundles for Newton. Those could be applications that you've downloaded or someone gave you on a floppy, or they could be new system enhancements that Apple provides to you, and you can install those directly from your computer. Now let's show you how easy it is to actually synchronize. We're going to connect this Newton to this Mac using uh, a local talk cable that we have here. So if we switch the screen back to the Newton, Bing. you'll see just how easy that is. So if Michael leans back a little bit, perfect, hold that pose. I'll tap on the extras drawer, and uh, the extras drawer holds some uh, utilities that come built into your Newton, as well as our inbox and outbox for communications. I'll tap on the connection application. You'll see three simple ch choices, connect to a Windows machine, connect to Macintosh over serial, or again, if you have a local talk network, you can take the faster option, which is to connect via local talk. Tapping choose Macintosh, Newton remembers the last two Macs I connected to. If we ask for more choices, Newton will actually scan the network. If we had multiple zones right now, we'd actually have a full chooser so we could move through zones. It's found this Mac here. We tap connect. And if we sw switch the screen back to the Macintosh, you'll see that the Newton and the Mac have established a dialogue. Information's going back and forth, and only the information that's changed since the last time we synchronized gets sent. Um, and it makes sure that both systems are up to date and have the most current data. Because Newton Connection supports local talk, you can actually connect from anywhere you are in your local talk network to any Macintosh running Newton Connection. Also, Newton Connection supports multiple users because it understands, as you can see, that this is James Joaquin's Newton that's being synchronized. So let's say you have a secretary in your office that supports multiple Newton users. They can connect in from anywhere in, that, uh, in the local talk network to that secretary's Macintosh running Newton Connection, and be their Newtons can be synchronized automatically. And Newton Connection will automatically pick the appropriate file to synchronize with them. So Newton Connection uh, synchronized my information, opened the file for me automatically. Uh, you'll see that it creates a folder, and it creates three files. It creates my, my Newton data file. It also keeps a backup for me, and it also keeps an archive file. The archive file is basically a history of all the information you've had on your Newton. Anytime you delete something between the times that you've connected, Newton Connection notices that. It says, oh, you've thrown away a couple of notes, or you removed some business cards. I'll move those to your archive file for you automatically. So if you ever need to refer to them later, you've got a history of everything you've had. So now let's take a look at how we can work with our Newton information on the desktop. First, we can look at our, our uh, calendar information. And just like the Newton here on the Mac, I can select multiple days, look at my meetings, create new meetings, et cetera. Also, uh, all the notes that we've created on our Newton are available here on the desktop. We get the same overview that Newton can produce. Double clicking on any of these notes actually brings up text, graphics, and ink, just as I created it on the Newton, editable here on the Mac. What's important about Newton Connection is that it's really a platform, because you can see that we have a list of the applications that Newton understands, the built-in applications, datebook, name, file, and notepad. But all add-in applications get Newton synchronization for free using Newton Connection. So any application developer, let's say, that writes a checkbook application, automatically gets synchronization capability back with a desktop. So let's say I'm uh, out, out uh, writing checks, and I'm logging those on a checkbook application that's written by a third party. Meanwhile, back uh, at home, my spouse, if I, if I were to have a spouse, would be writing checks and uh, typing them in in the Macintosh. When I get back, you can actually plug the two together and synchronize that information, and the developer had to do nothing in order to do that. That all comes for free using Newton Connection, synchronization with, between the PDA and the PC. You can also use Newton Connection to find information once you have it on the desktop. So I opened up our name file. If I'd like to find that card that Michael just beamed to me, uh, I can just tap A here above the company name column, tap search. Newton Connection will show me all the companies beginning with A. There's Aspen Paragliding. Double clicking on that brings up that information. All the same address book fields that we have on the Newton are available here on the desktop. 
So you can create, enter, and edit information on your Macintosh or PC, uh, even without Newton connected. So uh, while you're out of the office, once again, your associate can be adding things to your Newton. And it's also important to understand that this, the same capabilities that are available for the Macintosh are available for PCs running Windows. So even if you made the wrong choice in desktop personal computers, <laughs> you can make the right choice in PDAs. <laughs> also, the, another, another point that we make, no other platform offers this kind of ease of use in both connectivity and synchronization of data. We actually contend that it is easier to connect a, a Newton PDA to a Windows desktop machine than it is to connect a Windows notebook computer to a Windows desktop machine. OK, Which now we're going to uh, switch over and talk about another tool that we provided uh, on the desktop to help, uh, help Newton users work with their Newton. And this one is particularly for developers. It's called the Newton Toolkit. And like the message pad, it started shipping here at Macworld. And it's a complete solution for building a Newton application from start to finish. So it's a powerful development environment that we think is going to, is going to allow third parties to build a wide range of add-in software for Newton. One of the things we said earlier is that in this brave new world of uh, personal interactive electronics, all we'd like to do is completely rewrite the rules of the software industry. Who, who writes the software, how they write the software, how they deliver the software, and the type of software that gets written. Because ultimately, if these are going to be personal devices, people have to get software that's personalized to them. There's going to be a much, there needs to be a much wider range of software, not a consolidation of types of software that's out there. You don't just want to have one spreadsheet, one database, one word processor. You want to have a range of software that's tied to your particular work or lifestyle. And Newton Connection makes software development easier, so there's much, there are much fewer barriers between the great idea and a uh, shipping application. So we'll give you a brief tour of how easy that is to do with Newton Toolkit. Uh, what we're going to do is put together a sample application that we've pre-built the pieces of. And this is a medical application that a doctor might use to examine a patient. And um, not too many people know this, but Michael is a licensed physician. So he will be demonstrating this in a moment. The first thing uh, we see when we run Newton Toolkit is we get a project window. This is a place to keep track of all the files that you, the developer, will build as part of your application. So let's add some files to that project. We're going to add a resource file to keep track of graphics. We can take advantage of the Macintosh to create things like graphics and sounds and fonts and use those in our Newton application. We'll also add a layout file. Layout files describe the user interface objects that make up our application. So when I open that layout, you'll see Newton Toolkit has done a couple of things. It's brought up the, the, the interface or the screen of our application. And you see there's a canvas the size of the message pad screen. And I can ask Newton Toolkit to give me a preview so each of these objects draw themselves the way they're actually going to look on the Newton. It's also brought up a palette of what we call Newton components. These are pre-built components. They're objects in the Newton system that developers can reuse. So if you want to build a field that understands handwriting, or a graphical slider that can set information, or a pop-up that a user can choose uh, from a list, all those objects are built in. So you literally just sketch them out on your application. Newton creates the objects for them behind the scenes. A lot of people asked us, why, did, why when you announced your technology did you not have development kits available? Why, didn't, why did it take you so, uh, so long to get development kits out? Well, the reason why is because our f development philosophy was to make programmers able to leverage all the code that's in the ROM, which means we had to be able to finish it. And once it was finished, we could make it available so that, you, so that those developers wouldn't have to rewrite that code. What that means for developers is that, that their sophisticated applications leverage stuff that's already built into our ROM so it makes their applications faster faster and easier to develop. And that also means that the 25 developers uh, applications that you see out on the show floor on, at Symphony Hall, many of them were developed with ve in very, very little time. That They were able to get to um, uh, demoable applications very, very quickly using Newton Toolkit. So of course, after you've graphically created your application, we have a powerful set of browsers and, and a powerful programming language to attach uh, programmatic information. So you can actually write code that adds intelligence to your application after you've created it graphically. OK, now let's switch over to the Newton. And Michael's going to show you this medical application in action. Um, again, we put this together actually on a PowerBook on a plane uh, because the Newton Toolkit will actually run in a fairly small amount of memory, which is another benefit for us. Um, as we're rushing to a keynote, uh, we, uh, Tony Espinosa, tool specialist, actually created this application. And as James said, it's a uh, patient uh, application that allows a physician to, uh, to write in information and log a patient visit. So let's say uh, we write in 
Anderson. Newton uh, recognizes that information, and once I tap X, you can see that Newton looks up that information in the card file. So any application that's written on Newton has the ability to look through that information database and pull up names and addresses as an example. This is an example of that. I didn't have to convert files over in order to grab that information. For you, the user, that means you only have to enter information once in one place. You don't have to keep duplicating that information from application to application because all applications can share it. This application also allows me to enter new information, numeric information, and because Newton understands it's numeric information, if I double tap on this field, it automatically brings up a numeric keypad for me to enter that information. I can't. Sorry. Um, and uh, I can also write in information, and Newton's uh, numeric recognizer recognizes that. And if I make a mistake, I can just write over it. And there it goes. Okay. Now that, so, Michael, that, uh, that weight looks a little high. I think you may want further examination on this patient. Well, that's a good idea, James. Uh, well, what I should do then is move the weight icon over to the graphing tool, and Newton will automatically generate a chart with historical information about uh, this patient's weight over time. And it appears there is a dangerous and troublesome trend here. <laughs> which requires further examination of the head. <laughs> so we'll tap examine. Newton brings up a scanned image of the nose and throat area. Now, because Newton Toolkit runs on the, uh, on the Macintosh platform, it has full access to the types of image editing tools that you use on the Macintosh today, scanning tools, paint tools, et cetera. You can use that information in your application, so you can, do very, uh, you can use uh, sophisticated graphics like that very, very easily without having to draw them in. Now I can mark up on this, I can say, okay, everyone knows this joke by now, but you know, there appears to be a buildup of food in the mouth area, mm, yes. which seems to be contributing to the higher weight, so I can do that. I can now sign that as a physician would, and, um, <laughs> and because this application is built using the Newton application framework, I have the same communications capabilities that are built into all applications. I can print this, uh, this form, I can fax it to someone, I can beam it to another physician who's on the same floor, I can mail it using Newton Mail across the country or across the world, and I can connect it to my Macintosh or PC and upload and update that information to my desktop computer. We've also added, using Newton's communications architecture, a new capability called Update Host, which allows us to update that information to a, to a host system uh, in a client-server environment. So you can see that even simple applications have the ability to have very, very powerful communications capabilities. Okay, that is the, uh, I get the watch, which means we're running out of time. So that's uh, time to turn it over to questions. Uh, is there a way to uh, provide uh, security to your own personal Newton so that uh, unauthorized people can't have access to your files? That's a very good question. Uh, yes, there is. If you tap personal, you're able to set a password, and that password will come up every time the system goes to sleep, every time you turn on the system, prompt you for it, you write it in, then Newton will, only, will unlock the system uh, after that. Uh, if you don't write it in, you can't get access to the data. So it safeguards your personal data. Hi, um, I'm Jim Ronaldo, uh, content director for BCS Newton PDA. Um, I spent most of last night playing with the toolkit. It's quite cool, but I have two questions. Um, the first one is the toolkit came with a um, publishing agreement which stated uh, how, what channel I was trying to sell my application into. Um, it didn't have any listing for public domain apps, and does that mean that Apple is going to charge us money for it? Um, secondly, there's been rumors that um, Apple's had to do some patching for the Newtons. Is that going to be available uh, to the public in case they pull out both of their batteries? I'll take, I take the first. No, I'll take the second. Okay, first on the toolkit, I don't have the exact um, the licensing agreement in front of me. Of course, it's written by lawyers, so it's not meant to be understood by humans anyway. <laughs> um, but um, you, you don't have anything to worry about. In terms of uh, freeware or shareware type applications, there's no, uh, any, there's no kind of royalty or fee associated with that. The agreement is for uh, commercial publishers and corporate publishers of software. Um, but for, for shareware, it's wide open. Second question, um, the, the question about software updates. Newton is a ROM-based system. As a ROM-based system, we have to be able to upgrade the software. The way we do that is through what we call software updates. Special area of uh, system RAM which is dedicated to us uh, adding files which update the system functionality. I will let you in on a little secret. Um, 
a few, or a few what we believe isolated cases we found that in, through uh, some glitches in our manufacturing process, it is possible that some users did not get the latest version of that update file. If that happens, the best way to figure that out is then they plug in your getting started card, your getting started card doesn't work. So <laughs> that would be a dead giveaway. So uh, what we've been doing, what we've done is we've inspected uh, all units that were sold uh, to make sh absolutely sure they have the latest version of the software update on them. Uh, in, in most cases, the backup battery will hold your user data and the software update for longer than you will own this Newton, anywhere from five to 10 years. Uh, so uh, by that time, you should probably trade in your Newton. Next question. How much learning does do these things really do? I've been trying for the last hour to get it to recognize the word Newton, and it doesn't even try. It just turns it into a graphic. And I've changed my preferences and checked all that stuff. I've been working with it for many hours. Uh, I can write the word new over and over and over and over again, and the word 10 over and over and over again, but new ton just stays a graphic. Did you add to your dictionary? Oh, it's in the, it's okay, in the dictionary. 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 You bet. Well, let's take a look at your unit. Yeah, you up. might have. But, but have I guess my question is how much record. learning does it really do? Will it, it, will it reach a point where it's no, done know, learning? A lot. Let me, let me show Some, you. But uh, not too much. Let me show you on my Newton. Uh, we'll go to letter styles. Uh, letter style shows you for each letter uh, a character in the alphabet the different ways that Newton might uh, recognize how you draw that. Over time, Newton learns which styles you use and don't use. So you'll see for some of these, you, maybe you can't see it on the screen, but some of them are grayed out. So Newton learns and turns off some of the styles automatically. Real quick question. Uh, yes to Newton's Mondo Cool, but can we get some information into it from the Macintosh? I noticed that your Macintosh kit, does that allow any kind of importing at all? Okay, two, Assuming two, we have any kind of tab delimited, comma delimited format. Yeah. Two, uh, two things about, about Newton Connection. The first is, if you purchase a Newton at Macworld, you, uh, you get for free, you get a, a big stack of yellow coupons. And one of those yellow coupons entitles you to a free sneak preview version of Newton Connection. Uh, point 0.9 version. So any of you who did purchase it and didn't get that yellow coupon, bring, go to the Symphony Hall with your sales receipt and we'll give you the cable and the software uh, to let you run Newton Connection. And uh, now uh, James will talk about Newton Connection Pro. Also, there's, for each platform, Mac and Windows, there are two versions of Newton Connection available. The entry-level version lets you do all the things we showed you here today. Coming soon will be a professional version of Newton Connection, and, and you'll also be able to upgrade to that version. What that adds is it adds the ability to import, export, and translate your Newton information to and from file format. So if you have a Dynadex file that you want to import into your names file, or you have some notes you took that you want to save as a MacWrite file, all that can happen automatically with Newton Connection Pro. In fact, at the keynote, we demonstrated a Meeting Maker connection to Newton using Newton Connection Kit Pro, so that you can actually download from a group calendar to your Newton using, using Newton Connection. An important uh, source of revenue for a lot of user groups is the public domain and shareware libraries. And I can see how people would want to uh, put into those libraries new Newton objects and uh, new uh, applications and add-ons and things. What sort of media would those things be distributed in? Would, would they be largely distributed on Mac disks and downloaded through Newton Connections? Or would we have to get into the flashcard business? Or how generally would, would someone who wanted to set up a Newton library go about uh, distributing it uh, widely? Well, our ultimate goal in Newton software, remember I told you we want to change the rules of the software industry. One of the ways you want to do that is by moving as quickly as possible to online distribution. That lowers the cost of goods of any software application to the point uh, where if small applications, and applications in Newton are typically quite small, can be easily uh, downloaded into the system and used. And that way, you uh, shareware, that works particularly well for shareware applications. Most commercial applications will probably come out on flashcards first. Uh, because uh, typically they're quite, uh, some of them are very co are content based and quite large, and that's the appropriate medium. You can also, of course, load packages through Newton Connection, but of course, people have to have a PC or Macintosh in order to do that. So we actually expect to see all three sorts of uh, types of distribution for uh, for Newton software. How seriously bad a handwriting can the Newton recognize? I mean, thinking about some I'm of the sorry? people in my office, the sort of scrawls that they make on paper, I think are going to be a serious challenge, even for a very intelligent um, Well, so as we said at, the, at our BCS briefing, seriously bad, but not too seriously bad. Um, Newton, handwriting, is a, handwriting is a very personal thing. It's very difficult to say uh, 
without seeing people's handwriting, whether Newton will do a good job of uh, recognizing it or not. What we do know is that, th that uh, the process by which Newton gets better recognition in your handwriting is it is a team effort. You adapt to it, and it adapts to your writing style. Do you have any sense of, I mean, how many people on a what percent of people on average can Absolutely recognize? Absolutely not, because it's not something you can yeah. do as a percentage, because everyone's writing style is different. I've seen how it uh, learns uh, your handwriting style, but what about object drawing? Um, I tried to draw a square earlier today, and if I drew it clockwise, it didn't recognize. If I drew it counterclockwise, it did. Um, is there a way of teaching it to learn the stroke style and guide sim it? Simple hint for drawing. Um, what uh, Newton is trying to do is segment what you draw into line segments. In order to get, uh, in order to get that to work better, pause at each vertex and keep your line segments that are supposed to be straight as straight as possible. Can you tell me about what exactly the reset button does when you press the reset button? The reset, the reset button, the first thing it does is it takes a penny out of your bank account and deposits it in Michael Chaz. Um, <laughs> Now, actually, seriously though, what it does is it, it, it starts the machine over, it doesn't lose any data, um, there, there's a watchdog going on every few seconds saving your data, so if you write a word and then hit reset, you know, immediately after you will lose that word or so. But in general, it's completely safe and it will help clean things up. And in fact, the gentleman that uh, has a Newton writing problem, he should probably hit the button and see what happens. That's an important point. Reset is not uh, data loss. Uh, we've, we've done a lot to protect user data. You can do a lot to Newton and not use user data. It's a PRAM reset. Uh, that's not entirely correct. OK, it's closer. Well, it's We're trying to understand <laughs> this. <laughs> it's kind of like well, thank, thank you for your question. <laughs> and I have a big thanks for the new team. about a lot of things, really. I think the part that excites me the most has to do with helping people keep in touch. The idea behind Newton is that it's an assistant, something that actively helps you as you capture, organize, and communicate your ideas and information. The possibilities are just limitless. When you think about it, the most natural way to get your thoughts down is to jot or to sketch. We wanted Newton to be that natural. It can either leave what you write in electronic ink or it can clean it up and organize it for you. I don't know about you, but I can't draw to save my life. But with Newton, it's a completely different story. People said to us, wouldn't it be great if you could design something that would allow you to take notes in your natural way and have Newton format them for you? So that's what we did. Newton's intelligent enough to take your messy notes and sketches and turn them into a letter. It'll even put graphics where they look best, and in general make the letter look more professional. From there, all you have to do is plug a printer into your Newton, and you're off. When you're done, Newton even has a smart way of getting rid of your trash. Say you're on a train or a plane or at a little cafe. You can write a fax. Say you want to send that fax to Margaret. You just highlight Margaret's name in the text, Tap fax. And Newton will automatically fill out a fax cover sheet with Margaret's number on it. We've built in Newton intelligence so that Newton knows enough about what you're trying to do to help you do it. The beauty of Newton is that any page you have in your Newton can be sent through email. Text, graphics, pages from your calendar, business cards. You just select email and, well, you send it. Simple as that. It seems to happen all the time these days. You're expecting a really important message, but you can't guarantee you're going to be easy to reach. By just getting the Newton messaging card, you can get your message wherever you go.
can share anything that's in your Newton with anyone else. Using Newton's built-in infrared networking capability, you can beam things to other people. It's pretty handy in meetings to just be able to send someone something instantly. Your business card or the notes or a calendar page. But Newton's even smarter than that. Everything's interconnected. You can get a message that someone wants to schedule a meeting with you. You can ask Newton to assist you. Newton will automatically put it on your calendar. You can even jot notes to jog your memory later or set an alarm. Or add a task to your to-do list. Kind of a communication center or universal inbox and outbox. I have way too much information in my life. I keep a calendar on my desktop computer. I keep a Rolodex file on my desktop computer. The Newton Connection Kit lets you connect your Newton to your PC or your Macintosh and share and store information. But it even comes with software that makes sure that the most up-to-date information gets put in both places. For example, if there's new calendar entries on your PC, they automatically get booked on your Newton and vice versa. This is all about being in charge of your life. Being able to have information so you can keep in touch with people. It's going to help you keep track of your time and your contacts, but it's going to do it in a way that's not intrusive to your lifestyle. I'd say that Newton is really peace of mind, right in the palm of your hand. You know, one of the best things about Newton is that it can understand your handwriting. That's pretty remarkable when you think about it. Now, some people find that it takes a little bit of practice. So in the next couple minutes, we're going to show you a few tips and techniques that'll make it even easier for Newton to interpret what you're doing. What's incredible is that Newton actually learns how you write. As you use Newton, it learns and adapts to your personal style. The result is that your Newton will fine tune itself to your handwriting better than anyone else's. And one of the key things about Newton is that it looks to recognize entire words instead of individual characters. And because it's looking for words as opposed to letters, it's important to write neatly and not pause in the middle of a word. If you pause in the middle of writing a word, Newton thinks you're finished and tries to recognize what you've written. And if you're finished writing a word, don't go back to improve on your handwriting or correct it, even if Newton hasn't recognized it yet. When you go back, it throws Newton off. And that's because Newton figures out what you're writing based in part on the timing and sequence of your handwriting. When writing a sentence, leave some space between the words, even exaggerate it a little bit. So Newton can tell when you finish one word and started another. If you write two words too close together, Newton may read them as a single word. Finally, an important and very basic technique is to just write as simply and neatly as you can. Be sure you cross your T's and dot your I's, make your O's look like O's and your A's look like A's. It's common sense, really, but it makes a big difference in how well Newton can interpret your writing. You know, Newton's pretty smart, but it's not always going to get your handwriting right. Like anyone, it can make mistakes. If it does, it's really simple to fix. If Newton gets a word wrong, tap on the word twice, you'll see a list of its best guesses. Find the right word, select it, Newton corrects the mistake. There's over 10,000 words in here. There's a lot of words Newton knows. But certain kinds of words, things like last names, street addresses, they're not going to be built in. When you write one of those words, Newton's going to give you its best guess. Here's the cool thing. You can teach Newton new words. After you write a word and you want to teach it to Newton, just double tap on the word. Then tap the keyboard icon. Now you can enter the word. Newton will ask you if you want to add it to your word list. Tap yes, Newton remembers the word. The next time you write it, Newton gets it right. Now if the word's only slightly misread, let's say one letter's off, no problem. Just write the correct letter on top of the one you want to change. Scrubbing is the way that you take and delete a single word or a single letter simply by stroking up and down through it four times to make it disappear. Make sure the zigzag is taller and wider than the word or letter that you've chosen to delete. You can select a word first so Newton knows exactly which word you're trying to scrub. You select a word like you do anything else on the screen. Hold down the pen for a moment until a heavy mark appears, then draw through the word to select it. You can review all these tips and techniques on the quick reference card and the handbook that came with your Newton. 
You're ready to try your handwriting on Newton. There's two great places to start. The game on the Getting Started card and the handwriting practice area both let you write words on Newton and learn more about how Newton recognizes your handwriting. As you write, you're giving Newton information about your style. Newton takes that info and learns and keeps track of how you write. Your setup guide has instructions on using the Getting Started card. So, why don't you go to your setup guide now and get started? Apple Computer, we take a lot of pride in the systems and products we offer. We've made the Macintosh the best system on the market by putting extra care into every aspect of design and functionality. We want the user to enjoy his or her experience working with a Macintosh. When you enjoy your work, it's just that much easier to reach your maximum potential. This program is designed to help you reach your potential ergonomically by giving you tips on how to create a healthy and comfortable work environment with your computer system or workstation. So what is ergonomics? Ergonomics is the interaction between people and their environment. For example, when you borrow a friend's car. In order to drive the car comfortably, you adjust the seat, the mirrors, and the steering wheel to suit your posture. That's an example of good ergonomics how your body works with another object or device. Riding a bike is another good example, whether you're riding professionally or just for fun and exercise. You check and adjust all the different elements of your bicycle before you ride. The seat, handlebars, toe clips, all the working parts of the bicycle that help to distribute the workload evenly throughout your body and improve your performance. The point is that sitting at a computer is the same as any activity that's subject to long-term repetitive usage. Proper ergonomic positioning can greatly increase your performance and enjoyment in the office. Here at Apple Computer, we work hard to establish a trusting, responsible relationship with our customers. Training and support are just as important as the products we design. Naturally, proper ergonomic interface with the product is a substantial part of that equation. Dr. Rempel, director of the Ergonomic Study Lab at the University of California, specializes in the study of ergonomics. Setting up your computer can make a big difference. Setting up the screen, the keyboard, and the chair right can help prevent some of the muscle aches and pains that would develop if you had to sit in the same position all day long for day after day. This tape is part of an effort by Apple Computer to educate our customers and employees with concerns toward proper ergonomics. A few simple adjustments may increase your comfort and your job performance at your workstation. Gary Meekirk, Apple's safety manager, heads up Apple's ergonomics training program. There have been a number of studies to look at what are the effects of introducing good ergonomics into the workplace. And these studies have shown that not only do you get an increase in job productivity, but also job satisfaction. Now that you have a better understanding of ergonomics, let's look at some steps we can take to get the most out of your Macintosh, starting with the chair you sit in. Well, the chair is important because it's probably the piece of equipment in your office that you're most in contact with throughout the day. You know, you sit in the thing for um, eight hours, sometimes longer through the day, day after day, and if you adjust it right, you can prevent some of the discomforts in your legs and your lower back and even your neck. 
When you go to find that chair you'll be sitting in for most of your work day, be a little picky. Choose a comfortable chair that will adjust to meet your needs. Make sure the chair supports your lower lumbar region and allows you to change your posture throughout the day. To properly adjust the height of your chair, you want to remember two things. First, your chair height should allow you to sit with your feet flat on the floor. If your chair won't adjust to this ideal height, there are footrests on the market that will allow your feet to rest comfortably. Second, your elbow should be about keyboard height so that your forearms are horizontal when typing. We'll talk about where your keyboard should be later. If you have to choose between proper arm height and having your feet flat on the floor, give priority to your arms and get a foot rest. Now, if your desktop is adjustable, let your feet be your priority in determining the proper chair height. Keyboard placement is extremely important. If the keyboard's too high, a lot of times people will raise their shoulders up, and this will cause neck and shoulder tension. If the keyboard's too low, we'll have a tendency to extend our hands back, and we want to keep our wrists really in a neutral position. Also, if the keyboard's too low, you can hit your knees into the keyboard. So it's important that you adjust the keyboard to really fit your needs. Now let's head back to that keyboard for a second. When sitting upright, the ideal position for your forearms is somewhere between 70 and 90 degrees from vertical. Keep in mind that your arms should hang naturally at your side. If your keyboard has a tilt adjustment, experiment with the settings until you find one that's comfortable. Remember to keep your wrists in a neutral position. Wrists or keyboard pads can also be purchased that allow for your arms to rest comfortably while proofreading or taking short breaks. But typing with your wrists on the pads may limit your overall movement. It's probably best to let your hands float above the keys, distributing the movement throughout all the muscles in your hands and arms. The same thing goes for using a mouse. The height of your mouse should be the same as your keyboard and as close as possible. When you move the mouse, if possible, use your full arm, not just your wrist. And because your mouse is easily operated from both sides of your keyboard, if one hand gets tired, switch your mouse to the other hand. One final tip in using your keyboard is to train yourself to type lightly. Apple computer keyboards don't need much pressure to respond, and your hands don't need the extra work. Take the time to find the minimal force required to operate your keyboard. When you sit in front of a computer and do computer work, um, it's a very visually demanding task. Your eyes have to stare at one point for a long period of time, or one area for a long period of time. And you want to uh, do everything you can to prevent eye strain. And that includes adjusting the screen to the proper height, um, keeping the, the screen clean, and preventing and reducing glare on the screen. Next, let's talk about your monitor. There are a couple of things to keep in mind when you place your monitor, starting with the lighting in your office, cube, or workspace. Although it might seem obvious not to place a monitor so it reflects light back into your eyes, it's easy to set the monitor up in the morning, only to find that at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the sun shines through the window and changes your conditions. Some of us just ignore the change and try to work around it, resulting in eye strains and headaches right before it's time to head home. Take the time to set your monitor in the proper lighting conditions. If possible, position your monitor at a 90 degree angle from any outside window and utilize blinds or curtains in the office space to cut down on that glare. You might even move your workstation to another corner of the office or cubicle. Avoid letting dust build up on your monitor screen. It makes it difficult for your eyes to focus. Brightness and contrast levels are important too. Make sure your monitor's brightness and contrast controls are adjusted so that your eyes are comfortable while viewing. If the conditions around you can't be adjusted by light levels, positioning, or blinds, a glare screen can be purchased. 
If you do need to purchase a glare screen, make sure it doesn't interfere with the clarity of the monitor. Now let's talk about height and distance. If the monitor is placed in an awkward position, your neck and shoulder muscles could become tired or strained. Height-wise, the top of your monitor should be slightly below eye level. Usually this can be accomplished by simply placing the monitor on top of the computer itself. Some of the newer Apple monitors come equipped with stands, or you can purchase a monitor stand separately. Distance-wise depends on your preference. Average distance is anywhere between 18 to 28 inches. The important thing to check is that your desktop is deep enough to suit your distance needs. Once again, monitor stands and extensions are available through outside vendors should your desktop not suit your preference. Here's another tip. If you spend a lot of time working from hard copy, purchase a stand or clipboard that allows you to place your paperwork at the same distance from your eyes as the monitor. Continuously focusing your eyes between two distances may also lead to eye fatigue, neck strain, and headaches. Also, remember to blink your eyes to reduce dryness. And take frequent rest breaks by glancing away to distant objects. You should also have your eyes checked by an ophthalmologist or an optometrist. Statistics show that more than 30% of the population are in need of corrective lenses. You might be one of them. Furthermore, some computer operators may need special glasses to work at this distance. Consult your vision care specialist to determine your need. You might want to put the same kind of thought into the other tools you use during your workday, like your phone. Make sure it's easy to reach. If you spend a good amount of time using your phone, consider investing in a headset. You'll feel a lot better at the end of the day. It's really important that we take breaks throughout the day. If you think about it, our bodies are really designed to move, and we need to have a lot of movement. If I had you put your arms up in the air only for a few minutes, you could feel the fatigue. So it's important that we move throughout the day and take a lot of breaks. But no matter what kind of computer you work on, even the best ergonomically designed workstation is only a step toward creating a healthy, comfortable work environment. Take positive steps to manage the stress in your life. Experts tell us that stress plays an extremely important role in determining our health and well-being. Take frequent breaks and stretch. Design your workday so you alternate your keyboard time with other activities. If you start to develop discomfort related to your work environment, talk to a qualified health consultant. Okay, let's do a quick review here. Adjust your chair height so your feet are flat on the floor. Position your keyboard so the height is horizontal to your elbows with minimum tilt of the wrists. Position your mouse at the same height as your keyboard. Set up your monitor so that the top of the screen is slightly below eye level. Position the monitor to avoid glare and keep the screen free of dust. Make sure your monitor's brightness and contrast controls are properly adjusted. Take frequent breaks, change your posture often, and design alternate activities into your work schedule. Make an appointment with a qualified health professional if any problems develop. Here at Apple Computer, we like to think that the Macintosh is a little more than the average personal computer. We design Apple Computer systems for the individual, you, and we think that shows. If you're sitting in front of an Apple Computer, you're sitting in front of the best in the industry. Let your office setup reflect it. Your work environment is a system designed by you. 
All these tips will help you utilize your workstation to maximum potential. And who wouldn't want to achieve that? So now you know. Work smart and have fun doing it.